Hi, this is Joseph Plank, and I'm here with, what's your name? Curtis Young. Curtis Young. And what do you do, Curtis? I'm a writer. You're a writer. I'm a thinker. You're a thinker. I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. Yeah. And what do you think about? What do you write about? What do you teach? Life, uh, our society, uh, the construction of, our, of our, our public space, the public sphere. So what does that mean? I teach geopolitics, political science. I'm teaching, uh, I'm doing a lot of work in comparative politics. I'm doing, in fact, I'm doing a course where I'm comparing the French and the American political process, the modern political process. So I'm looking at the two elections that are going on, the election in 2012 with President Sarkozy and the election in 2012 in America with President Obama. Okay, have you written any books? I've not written any books. I'm in the process of writing two right now, in fact. I'm writing a book, in fact, on a, a, a comparison between French and American politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also writing a book that has a lot to do with my, my, uh, my, my trip uh, in the advertising agency business. Your trip in the advertising agency yeah. business, what does that mean? That means that in the 1970s, I stumbled upon uh, uh, the world of advertising mm -hmm. and found it intriguing and, and, and worked out a way to insinuate myself into the business mm -hmm. uh, as a writer. So I was an advertising copywriter for, for many, many, many years, um, important years, mm -hmm. during the years when advertising was changing in America, right after the Jewish copywriters came in and began to change the face of advertising, the Italian art directors came in and then they began to hire black mm -hmm. copywriters. So I was one of the early black copywriters at Young and Ruby Cam, in fact, mm -hmm. um, and how how we began to do the kind of work that makes advertising um, a, a part of our cultural expression. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the arts. It's mm -hmm. not cinema, it's not, it's not it's art, art, plastic arts, but at the same time, it has the kind of impact on our society that led to this very important series in American television now called Mad Men. That's the, the I came in to the advertising business at the end at the last episode of Mad Men. Okay, what's Mad Men? Mad Men is this, it's, it's the story of, of the advertising agency business in the 1960s. It's on television in America. It's an HBO project. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's American advertising agency business when it was, the American advertising agency business was a wasp gentleman's affair. Mm -hmm. So uh, young white men Mm -hmm. from Connecticut, mm -hmm. commute into Grand Central Station and, and go to work at places like J. Walter Thompson and Batten, Burton, Dernstein and Osborne and Young and Ruby Cam and places like this. Mm -hmm. uh, as, they, as they tried to find out what they wanted to do in life, mm -hmm. and they would write articles for the Saturday Evening Post and, and the and the and uh, what was that magazine? The Saturday Review, and the New Yorker, and things like this. At the same time that they were creating advertising, so advertising was a very closed club mm -hmm. in New York until the 1960s. And Mad Men sort of uh, looks at that time. It's, it's 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 very interesting because advertising has such an important impact on our understanding of who we are culturally. Okay, and how does someone get to where you are today? What did you what did you do when you were little? to get to where you are today. <laughs> what did I do? You know what I did when I was little to get to where I, I am today, which, is, which, which drove my father crazy, is that I was a dreamer. You were a dreamer. You had a dream. Did I you followed I, the dream? No, I didn't have a dream. I just dreamed. Okay. I always dreamed about there has to be something different than this. There has to be another way of looking at that. There has to be another kind of way of managing our society. I dreamed my father would go crazy with this dream. It was, it was, there were dreams that were facilitated by my darling Aunt Olivia, mm -hmm. because Aunt Olivia loved movies, mm -hmm. and she loved her soap operas, mm -hmm. and she would babysit us. Okay. And so being babysat by Aunt Olivia, I would have to go with her to the movies to see Humphrey Bogart and Olivia de Havilland and Rita Haywood and, and, uh, and, and all of these classic people. 
mm-hmm. and and listen to her and listen to these sorts of things. And what it did is it fired my imagination. Mm-hmm. It allowed me to realize because all the things that I heard on the radio and all the things that I saw, I, the, particularly the radio, I would make pictures in my mind mm-hmm. of what I was listening to. Yeah. And so I realized that there was something really organic to storytelling. I didn't have a word for storytelling. My father called it dreaming. But what it was is I always imagined that it doesn't have to be this way, you mm-hmm. see. It could you be had another version. Different. I had my I had my version. You had your own version. My version, which was a little bit different, and it caused me many many problems up to the point where, when I went to high school, uh-huh. my first year in high school, I didn't go to classes mm-hmm. because the classes made no sense. Oh, so you were like uh, skipping school. I skipped school big time. And you had you had your own school. I had I had whatever I could, I had my school of jazz music, I had my school, because I, I grew up in Chicago, I had my school of going to the Art Institute, because I loved art, I loved Impressionist art. Uh-huh. I had my school of the books that I read, I loved to read. What did you like to read? I liked to read adventures. Adventures, like Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn? I like Jack London. Jack London? I like Jack London a lot. I like Jack London a lot. I liked, I liked Hemingway. Uh-huh. Uh I liked Fitzgerald. Uh-huh. Uh I liked Sinclair Lewis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked I liked st- there was there was something gritty. I liked stories that had to do with people and their environment and overcoming obstacles and making something happen. It sounds like you like the great American novel. I suppose I liked the great American novel. I don't know. At a certain point, I began to. I mean, I read. I I read Portnoy's Choice, for example. Portnoy's Choice. What's that? That Portnoy's Choice was uh, Saul Bellow. Saul Bellow. Okay. Paul Saul Bellow, Jewish writer. Uh-huh. That was another thing. I I I loved a lot of the work that the Jewish writers were doing because there was, because see, I grew up and when I grew up, the Jews and the and the and blacks were part of the same family. It was before Jews discovered that they were white. <laughs> And started separating themselves away from from blacks. I mean, I grew up in a time where Martin Luther King and 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 Rab, Rabbi Theodore Herschel walked down the street side by side. Mm-hmm. When Cheney and Goodman were Jewish brothers from Detroit who went down south and lost their lives fighting mm-hmm. the civil rights, mm-hmm. we lived side by side. My first boss, when my father asked my father when I was twelve years old for a bicycle, and he said, "Boy, you got to go to work." Mm-hmm. I went to work for Mr. Silverman. Okay. In his drugstore. I worked for Matthew Crane. I still remember him. Uh-huh. Okay. These are the Jewish guys who lived, who, who lived in our neighborhood. Okay. And coming back to your novel. Your novel is going to be an adventure novel then? My novel, my, actually my novel is, is, my novel is a love story to Paris. It's an autobiography then? I suppose. I'm yeah, not looking at it that way. Because you're in Paris right now. Yeah, but what I want to do is I want to share my Paris with my readers, which is, which is not the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre uh, and all of the things that we see in every American movie about Paris, but it's another, it's the, it's the Paris, it's a Paris around the corner. Uh-huh. It's a Paris down an alley. Uh-huh. It's a Paris of a cafe. It's a Paris of a community of people who come together. It's a Paris of people who stand at a counter and have coffee, some of them, uh-huh. Others of them having a beer, a glass of wine at seven <laughs> o'clock in the morning. Uh-huh. But that's a Paris that 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 we don't see if we don't live here. Okay. And I want to share that Paris, the neighborhoods, the streets, the cafes, the interesting people. The, there's a place that I like to go and have a drink in Strasbourg, Saint Denis, where the prostitutes come mm-hmm. to relax. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're not working, they come to sit down and have a drink, and we're friends. Okay. That's the Paris I want to go to. The Paris that I want to write about. The Paris uh, when I go down in the metro and the and the old wine old down there stands up and comes over and shakes my hand. Sounds like a Chester Himes to me. Would you compare yourself to a modern day Chester Himes? No. 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 Who would you compare yourself to me. if you had a person to, to yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're gonna make us discover something new. I don't know. I I suppose unless it because. I want you to discover me, and if you don't know me well, then that's something new. Is that why you write? I write because I have something that, that I want to say, uh-huh. and 
and it's the most efficient way for me to say things. Okay. It's the most efficient way for me to express ideas. To if, basic, you know why I write? Uh huh. To figure things out. To figure what out? Whatever it is. To figure things out. In other words, usually when I get to the end of something that I've written, it's like, oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So yeah. you're like, it's introspection. It is introspection. It's a uh, look at at, at the, in your own interior to find out who you are. Well, that's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, look, we arrive on Earth without a without a handbook. Uh huh. There's no there's no mot de l'emploi. There's no there's no book that says here's how to be a human being. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing, I think, our most important job mm -hmm. is to discover as quickly and as efficiently as possible what does it mean to be a human being yes. okay because for me this time is like this mm -hmm. it's it's we're here and it's gone yeah it's not like oh gee I'm alive and I'm gonna be alive forever uh-uh I'm alive and I'm gonna be gone just that quick so I better get to work to find out why am I here what's it about what is it about about being a human being and part of that is trying to connect with as many of these other human beings as possible because we're all here together. Okay. Okay? Okay. So this is why I write. This is why, this is, this is why I do everything that I do. This is why I teach. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to seeing that first novel of yours. Because you've written papers too, haven't you? I have written papers. I've, I've written papers. But most of the things that I've done are like... Uh, what did I do? I wrote a paper about Montesquieu. When Montesquieu was a young man, he wrote a book called uh, Les Lettres Persanes. Les Lettres. Les Lettres yeah. Persanes, the Persian letters. Mm -hmm. Which was fascinating because what he was looking at is, okay, we in France look outside, but what would it be like if the outside world looked back at us and wrote about us. And so what he has is he has these guys from uh, Persia who come to visit Paris mm -hmm. and they're writing letters back home mm -hmm. about their experience. And what it is is sort of a critique of, 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 uh, of absolutism because he's writing right after the death of, of Louis XIV and it's also a critique of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, uh, it has uh, an erotic side to it mm -hmm. because, because one of the things that Uzbek and Rika, these two characters who come here, they have a harem mm -hmm. and they're concerned about their harem and what's going on. Yeah. And, it's, and, and so there's, a, there's, a, an, there's sort of an erotic side to it and I argue in a paper that it's, the, it's an early instance mm -hmm. of, of the Orientalism that Edward Said talked about later on in 1979 when he wrote his book Orientalism about how we in the, in the Occident look at the Orient and imagine what it is and take it uh, what we imagine to be true. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I, what I, so I did a paper about how Montesquieu's Persian letters is an early excursion into Orientalism. So you've done a lot of studies. Where did you study? I studied at UCLA. Yeah, and what did you study? Uh, European history. European history. Yeah, I went to UCLA because I wanted to move to France and I thought that one had to speak French to, mm -hmm. to live here. I didn't know I could have gotten by <laughs> on, on English. But when I got to, because I'd been kicked out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, I always had this sense of, of that I was kind of dumb. Uh, Why? I wasn't as smart as other people because I didn't have a formal education. Uh -huh. Because I, had, I, had, I didn't finish high school. Because you were skipping school. Because I was skipping school. And one day my mother came home and she said, you know, I've been to that school more than you have. Uh -huh. But you were learning something else, somewhere else. I was you? learning about life. In the street. Yeah, but I, I, I gave it no credence. Uh -huh. I gave it no credence. I didn't realize that, it, that I was learning important things. Well, so, would you consider yourself a role model for those people? Because a lot of times we say people who like let let go of the school learned how to live. Would you say that applies to you? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, have, oh yeah 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 yeah. I'm Stephen Jobs. Mm -hmm. Stephen Jobs didn't go to university, and he's changed the way the world communicates. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was at the university, I was 50 years old already. Mm -hmm. I was very excited about being there and about learning things. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I was planning to move to Europe, and history was the one course that seemed to me to the one discipline that seemed to encompass so many other things because history includes anthropology and 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 sociology and and political science and 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 literature and literary criticism and all his to, to understand a history is to be connected with all of the social, all of the elements that, that construct the society socially and culturally. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to give me the broadest avenue of, of, of investigation. Mm -hmm. So I studied European history, I focused on France, uh, and, and in fact I did my doctoral thesis mm -hmm. on the relationship between France and the French colonies during the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Because as I read French history, given that the French had the, the largest, richest sugar-producing colony in the world mm -hmm. in the 18th century, and that following the same kind of ideas that motivated, that, that motivated the French Revolution, the slaves on the island of Saint-Domingue, which is now Haiti, mm -hmm. revolted in 1791. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, when I read French history, I read nothing about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that it's impossible to really understand the French Revolution without including the Haitian Revolution within the same, within the same narrative, mm -hmm. if you will. And so what I, what I, what I did my work on was, was in fact the idea of emancipation mm -hmm. and how emancipation is something that inspires people it, regardless of situation and colors and things like this, emancipation is a is a very deeply deeply human uh, instinct, mm -hmm. uh, and how these people were able to emancipate themselves and create a democracy. Would you consider yourself a self-made man? That's a little egotistical, mm -hmm. because I live in a community of humans. You live in a community. And so I made, because of my uncle Maurice, who was a card-carrying communist, and at the age of 10 years old took me with him when he delivered the Daily Worker. Mm -hmm. I made because of Anne Olivia. I made because of Mr. Hendricks, who lived next door from this guy from Mississippi, uh, and, his, and his son Butch. I made by, I made out of, I'm, I'm a part of the fabric of every human being I've encountered. To be self-made is not, it's, it's impossible. In any case, you've taught me one thing, and what you've taught me is, there's no age for education. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you, Joseph, so much. Bye. Bye.